Thank you very much, um, Harriet, for inviting me to do this presentation for the BAA. Um, this is a, a, um, a talk about the knowledge of Kant's from early medieval period to the 18th century in setting out roofs and buildings about the use of geometry and measurement. This new research is about the study of early carpentry and finding out how Anglo-Saxon Viking woodworkers and later medieval carpenters set out their buildings. Why do early medieval roofs have constant roof pitches of 43, 48, 52, 55 and 58 and 60? How were they able to do this without the use of numerical measurements or an understanding of geometry to make these constant angles? This was first published in Vernacular Architecture in 2020. This talk is about the practical application of how buildings can be set out without a tape measure and roof pitches without using a square or a protractor to measure the angles. This is how it's done. Research on this research on Anglo-Saxon and Viking measurements was carried out in the 1990s by four authors, Huggins, Betts, Marshall and Marshall. Their research was based on the computer data of excavated building plans to find out if they could find a standard measurement. Their results were inconclusive. However, Marshall and Marshall in their summing up stated that there were common denominators of building widths of 4.5 and 5.5 and 6 to 6.5, saying these building widths are determined by the length of the available structural timber that can be spanned by a single beam. These papers were published in 1991. This reference to the tie beam is the key to my research, which resulted in the discovery of Anglo-Saxon Carpenter's knowledge in setting out, which I believe continued in England to the 18th century. This drawing shows how the tie beam works supported on wall plates, given the width of the building. Um, Saxon buildings are, made, are all on post in the ground with a, a wall plate, as far as we know, and held together with a tie beam. And this is the tie beam holding the main structural timber of the building, which is still all the way through medieval buildings. This became the important structural member of the building. This method of measurement was made into tables with the use of a girth tape by Edward Hopis. These tables are still used today by woodmen and very likely by Saxon and Viking woodmen. This is a tree which you would measure with a string and I will demonstrate using a string on my glasses. And this is how I can simplify um, how it is done. You have um, a width of string um, which would go around the tree and we can assume that's the distance around the tree. The woodman then would then fold it in half and then he'd fold it into a quarter and then he would take three quarters there and then fold it again into four and into four, and that would give the size of the timber square uh, available for a beam out of that tree. So they would understand quite simply and quickly going through a wood that that tree would be suitable for the beam they want. If that beam was too small or too big, then I'd go and find another tree. Very simple and a very practical application, which is still used by woodmen today. Using this simple method of measurement on the tie beam, first as this simple method of measurement is applied to a tie beam. First establish point A and B on the tie beam, which would be the, from the wall plates, and then take a cord from A and B and fold it in half and find the center O. Mark on the face of the tie beam with chalk or charcoal, then fold the cord again and mark the, the beam at four, and fold the cord again at two, and mark the beam at one. With a short lath or using dividers set at naught to one, marked out 
it can be then marked out the rest of the beam. So from 0 to 1, you can then check 0.4 and 0.8 by striding out the dividers and adjusting them accordingly. And dividers used um, to do this would be um, metal dividers with a locking screw so you can fix the distance to mark it out. And here's the medieval um, master craftsman carrying his dividers. Using this method, the carpenter can achieve all these different roof pitches from just those eight increments on the tie beam, the half span of the tie beam. So if a timber is laid on the tie beam at, at five, it would have a roof pitch of 52 and at four, 48, etc. Very simple method of pitching a roof without using any geometry or any measurements. We go back to the tie beam and this I will demonstrate how a roof is, is pitched. We have again back to the tie beam with the increments which are on the tie beam at the half span of 0 to 8. Then the carpenter will lay a timber on the side of the tie beam and use it, use those marks to mark the rafter. And if he marks the rafter at four, he will then use this length, which will be 48 degrees. So then he would do two rafters like that and join them together. And then if he uses 0.6 or 0.10, he can then get the exact correct position of the collars. This became very important in the crown post roof, which was developed much later on. Here's some examples of, tie, of a tie beam that was found in, in York in the excavations at Coppergate. And you can see this, this actual timber was used as um, a floor joist, hence it's been reused. But it very clearly shows a housing with a peg, which would have been this timber here, which I've sketched. So there's good evidence that uh, this method was very well used by Viking and Saxon builders. Here's an example of a wall plate. And you can see here where the support timbers were mortised into the wall plate. And you can see mortis, uh, peg holes maybe to support the rafters. Here's another example of excavations at Cowdery Down showing their layout of the Saxon building, very clearly marked with um, support planks and supporting what I've shown, the wall plates, which go around the edge. And often and very common on Saxon buildings that are double square. So we have two squares, which makes the building complete. And I've shown a section of the tie beam, which is now divided into 16 units, which is the full span. Here, for example, how they would set that building out. You'd have a plan of the building and come to bang in a peg. He'd lay his rod, which is the width of the span of the building, and he put another peg in. You then move that rod to the next peg and you bang that in and you will get someone to sight him through. So we have a straight baseline. And then once that baseline is established, he then puts the rod across for the width of the building and you put a peg in and then you would set the rest of the building out. And this is the double square, which is very common uh, on Saxon buildings. Here we have Saxon roof pitches, which have been found, which has been recorded uh, by, this is Rodwell at Barton on Humber. Here we have the first roof at 60 degrees and the roof when the built church was extended and made bigger, there's one put in at 55 degrees. The other roof pitches are later buildings. Here we have examples of Bradford on Avon. This is 900 AD. This is the, the church chapel, which you can go and see in Bradford. This is the um, North Gable, and this is the original stonework, and it's exactly at 48 degrees. This is the original survey carried out by Irving in 1871 when the church was being restored. 
more evidence for Otter's Chapel in Deerhurst in Gloucestershire. This also has a picture of 48 degrees, um, surveyed and identified by Curry, and he published his findings in 1983. I drew over the top, just showing the divisions of the tie beam, and also how the rafter length was found, and also how um, the struts were positioned um, using position seven, but also the height of the building was set out using 14 units. So the Kant not only set out the roof, but he also set out the walls and gave the rod measurements to the stonemasons before he put his roof on. So that means that means that the carpenter had the roof designed before the building started. This is St Helen's Church in Hastings. This is a roof timbers of uh, 43 degrees, and I've shown that superimposed on the archaeological drawings. And this is the trench or the creasing of the roof, which survives, and the roof of 43 degrees fits snugly into those creasings. And that is roughly the layout. And not only does the, um, the dimensions, it also sets out the thickness of the walls. And also on Anders Chapel, um, the wall thickness could be based on the carpenter's measurement there of two units, which might be measurements the stonemason used on ground level, but they have got slightly thinner at the top. In Anglo-Saxon Architecture, published by Taylor, he, he recorded that there were 14 examples of surviving gables. However, the evidence of these Saxon roofs do not appear to have been recorded to date and their angles are not known, which is um, very difficult for me to do my research. Um, if I ever come across a church with scuffling up, hopefully one day I'll be able to measure them. Um, here's an example of a, a medieval image showing a carpenter measuring a timber uh, ready for cutting. Beautifully illustrated. Other roofs and examples I have been studying recently. Recently, this is Kempley Church, Gloucestershire, 1120 to 1150. This is dendro dated, and this works almost perfectly to the setting out using the divisions of this part of the collar of the roof. And it, not only that, but the positions A and B give the width of the wall. And then the divisions between that set out exactly the other collars and cause the pitch of the roof, which is 52 degrees. Another example is the Crescent Temple Bali Balm, uh, also works out um, exactly based on the typing. Other examples, this is Lee Court Balm in Worcestershire. This is a crux building is complete, very different construction to a frame truss building. And again, using a, a rod based across the wall plates and the divisions of the half pitch, you can see that they use those positions to set out the, the purlins and of course the length of the rafter. And not only that, they was able to set out the floor plan uh, of the barn. And the floor plan, consists of four square um, uh, squares. When we talk about the Saxons had two squares on their buildings, they've used this barn and they produce four uh, complete squares. So each rod being the width of the span is also four rods is the length of the barn. However, during this, during between the two squares, they put five bays of trusses. So five bays can't be divided up equally um, between um, 32 units. So I'm assuming, or I've looked at, taken the span of the rod, 16 units, and taking a cord and taking it round five times would give the would give, <clears throat> would then give the five units for the centers 
for the trusses. And I did an example in my garden, taking the width and then taking a cord through and then five times and then opening up the gap, which would give me exactly the distance of five trusses at 6.4. And I measured it out at, because it came out at 4.22, um, spot on. So uh, that is a very accurate way of setting out um, trusses on odd um, divisions between um, spaces and centers. Westminster Hall is also very clearly uh, set out using this method. Even the radiuses uh, of the arcs and the positions for the collars and obviously um, the length of the rafters. And again, 52 degrees. Monkey's Barn, which is 1786, um, this setting out method was still being used as late as 18th century. This barn worked out ideal for setting out the collars, rafter length, and, and the, the aisle. The Royal Commission of Historic Monuments in England uh, did a, a survey of medieval buildings in Kent in 1994. They studied 105 buildings, and the roof pitches are shown by this bar chart. And you can see here at 52 degrees, there's 42% um, of roofs with 40, 52 degree pitches. And then 27% at 55 and 20% at 20.9 at 48. Comparing that with a survey done by um, Nat Walcott and Dan Miles in 2013, they surveyed 134 buildings in the Midlands of England. And there, the 52 degrees had 30, between 30 and 35 um, percent. 48 degrees had just over 30 percent. And 55 degrees were 20. So there's quite a variation there of um, the different roof pitches were chosen by the carpenters in the Midlands compared to the carpenters using different roof pitches in the Southeast. Um, the reason for that could be on the choice of uh, roof covering, uh, maybe thatch was preferred or peg tiles um, and um, shingles, um, pan tiles could work on different roof pitches. So that's the end of my presentation. And, um, I hope uh, um, that was uh, an interesting insight into my research.